Did you ever see the Spy Magazine article um, called The Little Producer That Couldn't? I don't... It, I, uh, you know, for some reason, the, the Spy article, that sounds familiar. So I, a, I It know. was a whole diatribe. It was after Dina went public, and it basically was like a 12-page diatribe of how he failed oh. <laughs> miserably. <laughs> <laughs> and they even had him. They even had like a lineup and show how short he was. Oh my oh, god! They hammered him, hammered him. And um, one of the uh, one of the stories was he, you know, all. And one of the problems they addressed was um, he had all his scripts translated to Italian. Oh. And um, in <laughs> in in order to read them initially, so he read them, yeah, because he gotcha. couldn't read English. Right. And so he he did everything in Italian. And the, the story in Spy Magazine was that he had a director come to New York, and, um, and Dina said, well, my house in the Catskills is empty. You know, you can, you're welcome to go have a weekend there. However, um, my translator's staying there. And, um, and so the director packs up, goes up for a weekend at Catskills, right. gets there late right. uh, with his dog. You know, and wait, so they wake up Saturday morning together, and the translator comes in the kitchen, and they have pleasantries and good morning and the translator looks down and says oh what a lovely cat you have <laughs> so maybe there's wow maybe maybe there's wow it's just yeah maybe some of the scripts didn't quite translate uh properly <laughs> i have that article oh my god oh my god that's just too brilliant that's just too brilliant. And this was written back in the day. Yeah, I mean, it was. Like, it was like after DEG. Had DEG come and gone? DEG only lasted about right. a, two years right. at the most, right. and it was a, a, upon its failure. Gotcha. It was gotcha. A massive failure. Gotcha. So it was probably written in the late eighties. Yeah. yeah, and I believe that's the, where the quote um, came from. Uh, uh, everybody the, cry when the, when the monkey die. Everybody cry. It was, oh, okay. it was in that article. I must have. I not requoted. Read that, not requoted. Right. Here we are, episode four. Everybody loves the monkey. Uh, King Kong Lives was a lar- huge feature film that was shot here in 1986. Huge. Put yeah. a lot of us to work. And um, and our guest today, Michelle Johnson, A-list hairdresser who worked on the show, and Robbie Beck, who very first job in the movie business was on King Kong Lives. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I've I've known Robbie for years. I, I mean, I've known I, I knew Michelle back in the day, but then she went off to conquer the world. But uh, Robbie and I had a chance to work on a lot of shows uh, throughout the years, and I just I just find him to be one of the most you know just solid solid prop makers I, out I, there. I think you bring up a good point. Um, Michelle, you know, did move on and conquer New York City and the world, and Robbie Beck has has had a, an amazing career and has managed to keep his career in Wilmington. Stay right here. Yeah. You know, gone out and done some big stuff, but he he has always been based out of Wilmington. So, without further ado, um, Michelle Johnson and Robbie Beck on Rap Beer. Where have Michelle? Where have you been based out of for the last? I mean, have you been in? Where? I've been in New York for. That's pretty much where home base has been. Twenty-five years. Yeah, I mean, I I knew you had moved around a little bit when you first left here. I just didn't know where you settled, but it was New York. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I left here, I was on my way to New York, but I got offered to do homicide for a season, which was in Baltimore. Baltimore, which was perfect because at the weekends we could go to New York and look for a place to live. Oh wow! And look at school. And you know, take the train up, and like, it was so easy. So it was like the perfect transition. No kidding. And then I sold my house in North Carolina. So what we did before putting her in school in New York is, we hitchhiked around Africa for four and a half months. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Literally hitchhiked, bummed around. Sometimes, yeah. And I had a friend that had an old beat up, uh, you know, Range Rover. So I put it in the shelf and I fixed it up. And so part of the time we had our Range Rover with a rooftop tent. And oh my God. Sometimes we hired a guide. And a couple of times I got tired and I did old five star, you know, five star <laughs> safari. <laughs> it's allowed. It is allowed. A lot of times, you know, we had to dig a hole to poop in. Yeah. <laughs> but, but four months? 
How like exciting. Four and a half months. So well, that was like four to four and a half. Wow. From our last conversation, we learned that Michelle may have won the award for the furthest traveled to arrive at Wilmington Studios. Oh, is that right? To join the movie circus. Oh, really? Where, where yeah, from? Yeah. Well, it was England, South Africa. <laughs> Been here, <laughs> Johannesburg to Wilmington, right? Oh like my that. gosh! Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I that's pretty far. Furthest travel. I stopped award. to see my mom in Louisiana on the way up. Yeah. Oh wow! Oh wow! So, what good. was your first show? Blue Velvet was my actual first set. To well, it wasn't. When I woke up in South Africa, I had run out of money, and so. I was sleeping on a couch waiting for my mom to get me back to America. <laughs> I was okay. like, I ran out of money. I don't want her to stay. Get me. She was like, you come, you're coming here first. I was like, great. And I woke up in the so, morning. So your mom was living here? In Louisiana. Oh, that's what I thought. I yeah. thought it was Louisiana. Okay. But the best part of the story is, so I wake up on the couch in the airport, and there are people rolling in what I know now as 10Ks and all this <sighs> stuff and equipment and what have you. And I thought at first, oh, it's just like the news. But then now I know, of course, the news don't roll 10Ks in. <laughs> right, right. You know? And so I sat there all day, and I watched them making part of a movie. And I got on a plane, and next thing you know, I'm here working on movies. Oh, Pretty for God. crazy. So, so you, you, went, you went to uh, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And is, is, that, that, is that where the airport was that you saw them making the movie, or was it this no, airport? South Africa. Oh, it was in South Africa. Okay. Yeah. So so how did you get from Louisiana to Wilmington? I drove up. No, I mean, <laughs> did, did, did you? Did you call a car? Oh, my God. Um, no, but I'm Uber. just saying, were you coming here because you had heard they were making movies here? Yeah, my dad said the family were here. Um, okay. Yeah, there you go. So that's how we all ended up here. So I used to spend summers here. Okay. Back so, when they had sea urchin and starfish all over the beaches. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So so Wilmington was already familiar. Oh yeah. I used okay. to spend you know every second or third summer here. Oh growing that's up. awesome. Yeah. Oh that's awesome. Okay. So I, I literally I moved know. up, stayed with my grandmother for a short while. I got a job in a salon, and within weeks, I was asked to do some haircuts for Red Dragon or Manhunter, mm -hmm. and I got offered a job. So I never went back. Isn't that awesome? And I've been in this business yeah, you, ever since. You've got it. Your, your career's been amazing. Well, thank you. And, you know, my question, you know, set like All of you guys. Oh, my God. Come on. Between well, the four of us? Well, my, wow. my, my, my question is, you know, work as a set dresser, we usually show up about 6 o'clock in the morning. We're kind of the first people on set. But you look over at that hair and makeup trailer. You guys have been going at it for two hours. <laughs> What's going on in there? Oh, I've had what, like what? What is what? What's happening? And that's a world. Three forty-two a.m. call times. Like you know, in New York, you're driving <laughs> to work and you're like, "Damn, they're out partying still. What am I doing?" <laughs> yeah, but but I, I can't imagine what what that world must be like because you're preparing actors to go to hmm. to do a full day's work and hmm. this kind of quiet zone in the dark. Um, hmm. What's up? What's that like? Well, I mean, there's different types too. Like, yeah. of course, at the end of the day. When you get to those close-ups, nobody's going to care about their Jimmy Choo shoes. Like, it's going to be a woo-hoo. So we have to know what we're doing or at least be decent at what we're doing. But also, I think, especially times like that, especially those early calls or when people have problems and, they're you know, they've got kids, they've got lives, but yet they're in front of a camera all the time. Well, I think you know, my best thing is that I, I, I take my cue from them. You have to read the room. In the art department, I never want to affect an actor. You know, I just don't really want to have a conversation with them. I don't want to say hello because I want them. I don't want to be the guy, you know, that told the crude joke right before they had to go do their big scene or something. <laughs> so I just can't imagine having to be in their face, you know. But some of those great actors in the morning. can. They can okay. literally tell a joke themselves, and they turn the camera on, and next thing you know, they're so deep into crying and depression. It's like, wow. Yeah. I mean, and that's the beauty of what I do. I'm right there. I get to see, yeah. you know, it's like, wow. So, but, you know, I have to tell you, in the art department and props, some of the most amazing art department and props people are these people. They have to go in between every single take and reset stuff. Mm. Right. And some of those guys are like ninjas. Yes. You, you don't, don't even, see them. even realize they went in and reset shit. Like, they're magic. Yep. And those are the best yeah. and uh, sometimes you don't really even learn their name till halfway through because then you go oh my god yeah well, look, 
what he's been doing this yeah. whole time. Yeah. Wow. They're ninjas. Yeah. I was I was training a young person, you know, to work on set. I said, you know, those little sparrows that hang out at McDonald's, you know, and they fly in and take <laughs> French fries off the ground. You never, that's, that's what you need to be. You need to think about that's it. So true. Go in and do your job and get out. No cameraman wants to sit there and look at your backside while you're making your masterpiece. You know, <laughs> you got to sort it out, get in there and get out. And then we got weird stuff. Like, for instance, I'm one of those old school, like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But then at the same time, you got actors and people that they want to do this and this between you know well I'm, I'm patting my lips and shaking my hair um for those are, and but they want to do this every time between every single take they expect you to touch them up every single time and then your days go from being 12 hour days to 16 hour days and granted it's not what always hair and makeup they love to blame us sometimes it's lighting sometimes it's this sometimes it's that sometimes it's camera nobody's got a shot list i mean it goes on and on but a lot of it sometimes can be us so you know i've that's another thing i've learned if i just stay in their eye line when i need to like if they know i've come up and looked and looked uh, and i just kind of go and walk away which was a little subtle nod yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, they know I'm watching and they know I'm there. So after a while, maybe they won't want you to touch them every single time. Yeah. But, you know, insecurities come out in every way. Sometimes right. it's wardrobe. Yeah. Sometimes it's they just want something to they be fixed. They just want so somebody just, to touch something. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, some of them would rather never be touched. That's right. I've, I've seen that too. George C. Scott. Woo. <laughs> I loved him. By the yeah. way, have you have you by chance seen the television series uh, Upload? Oh, I have not. The the hair story is amazing. What it Upload is, is it, it's this quirky. I would say it's like a cross between Arrested Development and Black Mirror. You know, it's this weird <laughs> technology oh, I bet thing. My daughter's watching it. Yeah. Where you, if you die, you can get digitally uploaded to heaven. You know, so that's the premise. You have this sort of digital heaven, oh, wow. and real, and you can interact. You know, you can hang out with your. They basically capture your conscience, and but the way they so therefore now you have so people on digital. Earth, you have people in this digital heaven, and and back and forth, and people can come back and forth, and hair tracks everything. I thought of after talking with you the other week oh and God, watching I the show, I'm like, holy hair matters because each character so has two different, at least two different versions. Wow, and it's so subtle. And then um, not only wow. that, they even add to it that some of these characters have hair, and their hairdos and stuff are just amazing. All within kind of reality, not kind of science. Not Tim Burtony. Yeah. Not Tim Burtony, yeah. but um, but amazing. I thought thought about that, and even one yeah, of the one so of the cool. very first gags is a hair gag. That they kind of set it off to help, like you know that you got you've got to follow the hair if you want to know who you're who you're watching. Right, so. right, That's great right. show. And I really appreciate your craft, you know, after oh, wow. watching that show. I'll have to check it out. It's that a hoot. sounds cool. It's a hoot. So, Robbie. Hair matters. Let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's your autobiography. So, Robbie, um, I, I am, I'm just as curious about your origin story. So, h- how did you find Wilmington? Um, I was, um, I mean, um, there's an immediate story, I guess, of what I was doing just before I came here, which is in school at Carolina, and met a couple of guys who were having a degree in literature and classics I'm like what am I gonna do with that so I went to uh, further my education I'm like, well I'll go get um, a, a degree in film which didn't really exist at Carolina but I did meet some folks there that preceded me here and I'd been there about a year and a half and you know, what I thought was a master program master's program um, didn't end up being such but um, they came down they both got jobs within like a week of being here and they were like both of them contacted me one way or the other one of whom is at least at least one of whom is a part of this podcast scenario. Ah, um, and said, "Hey, guilty, if you want to really want to do this, get some experience." Because I didn't know I, I didn't know what anything was. You know, I didn't know what sure. a key grip was. You no. see all the credits, Neither you had no I. idea what yeah. those people do. Yeah. And what the, what they hell? I never are. paid attention to credits before I got in the <laughs> yeah. film business. Who are all those people? <laughs> what the hell is a best boy? They, yeah. they don't roll credits in the theater, do they, Scott? <laughs> you know, after the no, play, it's, there's it's, no credit roll. No, it's in the program. <laughs> You get well, to take it home. That's the other thing about streaming. You really aren't in credits anymore. You get to the end and you're like going to the next episode. <laughs> oh, my God. It, and I got to tell you, there's only been a – because, again, I still don't read credits most of the time. But, boy, when I want to read a credit and all of a sudden they're taking me to the next episode, and it's like, no, it's back, It's hard to back. get to it them. It is yeah. hard to like, get who to Who did them. what? I know. But even people that don't work in our business now know what IMDb is. 
Oh, yeah. They oh, want to yeah. know something, they look it right up. Right. Yeah. Well, that's it, because they, they can get little personal tidbits of their favorite, you know, people, and, and, and at the same time learn a little bit. You yeah. Know? You know what I really miss in this regard mm-hmm. is with digital music, where are my liner notes? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, I used to want to yes. – these beautiful you know, oh. eloquies about the – you know, the, the but, genesis of the album, uh, yeah. who did it, how they did it, and um, where is that? It's yeah. nowhere to be found. I can't even find who played bass, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get started. Uh, oh, my God. With photographs to do research? Yeah. You know, years ago, we used to either have vintage magazines, or like Beth has a ton of them, like myself, mm-hmm. like, you know, tons of vintage magazines. And then, of course, Skywalker Ranch. Then it got to the point where you literally could pay Skywalker Ranch to do some research for you. You can get two hundred dollars worth or a thousand dollars worth, and did you tell them details what you're looking Ooh. for? They would send it all to you. It was amazing. Wow! But nowadays, Pinterest has ruined everything. It, you look up so? a photo. Well, if you do a search for a photo, or if you put in something like, say, you know, 1950s New York diner. Gotcha. You know, or Queen's Diner. It, as far as specific. You're, you're researching. And things will pull up, but a lot of them are taken by Pinterest. And there's, an, like you said, there's no notes. There's no nothing. There's nothing under the photograph. Even if it was I originally see, see. in a newspaper, it uh, doesn't say anything underneath. You know, and you're like, well, what is that? How do I know that's exactly the period I'm looking for? How do I know that's exactly... Wow. Yeah, there's no yeah. problem. Yeah. But sorry, we, we were yeah. talking about Robbie. And how so what was, this what, was, what was your first credit, Robbie? Oh, it was King Kong Lives. Oh, screen credit? I think I did get a credit uh, on it. I think I did. Yeah, that's yeah, where as we I met recall. Them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was my first, you know, trial by fire, which you were a part of. Yeah, that, uh, that was my, that was my, I guess that was either my, that was my second gig as a rigger slash became a grip, but... Uh, Everybody yeah. loves the monkey. But, uh, yeah, everybody but, uh, you loved know, the monkey. But, but, I mean, for, for the rigging department, I mean, we worked eight months. On mm-hmm. that thing, building the stages out, because you know it was all tube, you know, tube and clamp, and you know it was all British. You know, uh, uh, Roy Clark Nobby was his name. He That's was right. the head rigger, and uh, and we used to just we just we just were so immature and childish. Roy Clark, ah, you know, <laughs> right? But everyone Behold. knew him as Nobby, and uh, but uh, anyway, that was you know for all of us. I think it was especially being your first show, and it be, might as well have been one of my first shows. It was so massive. Twenty, was so 20 million massive. dollars in nineteen eighty six dollars. Twenty yeah. million dollar production. Yeah. I think it went up to twenty two was what we spent here on but the But what lot. is the equivalent now? I'm curious. With it's inflation. You're, you're 120, 120, 150, 150 maybe. Yeah, at least you know, yeah, that's what I figured. Do the math, I don't know. Yeah. If it wasn't that it was Bull Durham, but it all blends together, you know, right. at this point. In terms of your screen credit. Yeah. Exactly. That's I think that might have been it. But I, I was living down on 3rd and Dock in a Wooster House. Had an apartment on the ground floor. Robbie Beck moved in upstairs. Yeah. Oh, Just, wow. Uh, and that's where we met. Yeah. And um, and I was busy working, and he was looking for a job. Oh, okay. Even well, though we had we had common friends from Carolina. I was going to say I thought it was a Carolina connection, but it was literally you just moved into the same place. Just happened to, yeah, move upstairs. Um, and I, I actually was working at a restaurant in, Carol, uh, in Chapel Hill, and they opened a restaurant down here. It was Papa Gallo's uh-huh. back in the day. Yeah. And so I was working there. So I did have a job, but doing this kind of work is what I ultimately wanted to do and, and get into, uh, not knowing what I was asking for. What was the dream? What, where, where, um, did, where did you think that was going to go? Well, I started out majoring in economics and accounting. And so after doing that, I'm like, I want the exact opposite, basically. Exactly. I see. Yeah. So you really weren't even worried about the future. It was just, I want the opposite of that. something that I enjoy doing. You gotcha. know? And even if it, if it leads to a career, good. If it doesn't, at least I did It'll lead something. to a degree. <laughs> yeah. It'll lead to yeah. getting me out of here. And yeah. back in those days, it seemed like you didn't necessarily have to specialize. You just, just having a college degree was enough. Absolutely. For and then you get into this business and realize, we don't care if you went yeah, to college right. or not. We don't need to see your, yeah. Your, yeah. your resume necessarily. Yeah. As, as set dressers, what? We work side by side with the P- PhDs and high school dropouts mm-hmm. and, and folks with very poor language skills, yes. but they're damn good set dressers. Yes, and, yeah. and, and everyone is treated equally. You know? Well, it turned out, you know, having a degree in literature did help me with oh, later I'm, on, like I'm reading sure. scripts and breaking down things and knowing sure. how to analyze characters and yep. giving thought what motivates someone. And because when you have this background of, reading literature and you're looking at the exact same thing a lot of novels have been turned in screenplays right right and right it, you know it gave me a background for you know it was doing props all you think about is how did somebody how did they become what they are 
what little things in their life, what little visual clues are there to who they are. Uh, so uh-huh. it all, you know, if you're thoughtful about it, it all makes sense and works together. So yeah. what, 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 was your, um, what was your first prop master? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, first one, yeah. my first key grip. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Well, that was a big one. Yeah. And that came about from the abyss because I met the uh, art director, Gary Wisner, and we became good buddies. And he had me like, I'd hang out on the weekends with him. And he's like, let's do this special thing. Because I was like the warehouse guy, which John right. got me to doing. And so I knew all this specialized equipment and all these things we had to order. And he's like, we need to hang, suspend so-and-so from here. Right. And I would know, well, you need this clever, this thing. Right. I can't remember the names <laughs> right, of right. all the PVC hangers. But and you knew. And yeah. So we'd go, get me the things we need to do that, and we'll do the special thing on this weekend. So just sometimes just he and I would go in and do some little thing on a set. And then he would, we became friends, and he was like, what do you really want to do? And I was like, I want to be a prop master, because I had been around Tantar. I'd been around other people that mm-hmm. did it, and I thought it was interesting. And I knew also that it wasn't as physical as being a set dresser. That's I'm right. Like, I'm never going to sustain I'm not going to be that guy. Yeah. It's not it, sustainable for yeah. a career. Yeah, if you, if you can't carry it two blocks drunk, it ain't a prop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bottom yeah. row. That's, that's, that's the cutting line right there. So I thought, well, that's great. He's a nice guy, you know, but the chances of, like, him actually helping me make this next step are probably minuscule. Right. So little did I know, he shows up as the art director on Ninja Turtles and right here in my backyard. And he call, does he call you? Here's your chance, yeah. Wow. He remembered and— uh, It was right after, really. It was right I after gotcha. the abyss, basically. Um, yeah, that's yeah, true. I'd never that's done true. it before. I'd been an assistant, I think. I have to go back and look. Right. Yeah, I'd definitely been a prop assistant. Um, but, you know, that was, again, just thrown into it. That was a big fantasy and film, and we made every was, single thing. I, I was going to say, you didn't buy a lot of that stuff. You no. literally created it. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and you're going up with Jim Henson and that crowd. Yeah, right. no ki- No, I mean, yeah, I, I was overwhelmed, you know, first of all, because, you know, I was just told I was doing it. You know, Bobby mm-hmm. just called and said, look, they want me to do this. I can't do it. I've given them your name. I've told them there's no one else. So you have to do it. <laughs> and, you know, and of course, I'm cocky enough to say, oh, yeah. And I'm terrified because it's like, I have no clue. <laughs> and and what's a turtle? <laughs> oh, my no, gosh. No idea. I well, had, it's I funny had no because idea. like yesterday or the day before I was at the grocery store and there are two young kids who are like 20 years old checking, checking, you know, checking me out. Not in that way, but um, <laughs> uh, they were saying, just between the two of them, they were like, we were just talking about who's the best Ninja Turtle. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I said, you know, I just I did props on the show, the shot here, and the guy was like, are you a They were like, oh, it's an honor to meet you, Dude, sir. It, that, that's where his that's, literary degree comes into play. Yeah. <laughs> that's where he can just wax eloquently about <laughs> no, but, his time on but Ninja, of, Tur- but the of Ninja all Turtle the, movie. But of all the <laughs> movies, but of all the movies I've, uh, I've worked on, and I've worked on a few decent ones, that's the one that people, especially people that are 50 and younger, mm-hmm. because that was their early teenage years or that they were mm-hmm. six and seven and eight or whatever. Um, the guy I work for now, you know, one of his favorite films ever. Of course, he's 39 years old, you know. Um, but, yeah, that film gets more rise out of people, yeah. you know. just and, and, again, it was such a unique kind of thing. Yeah, when, I, when I got my script for Ninja Turtles, I had went to a family reunion. And so I pulled it out and I looked at it I'm like, the hell is a teenage movie? Right, I right. Don't know what the hell it was? Well, funny enough, my one of my cousins does research for MIT, right? And his son was in there with all the adults. His son was just like him; couldn't relate to the kids. wasn't outside playing with them. But funny enough. He likes Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Knew what it was. Comic books. And yeah. So he knew what it was, and this and the other. And then he started drilling me. He goes. Well, do you understand the fourth dimension? And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he just went on and on about it. I was like, well, you know, I, a little bit of soap bubble theory, all that kind of, you know, I, I get a little bit. He goes, how can you work on it if you don't even understand it? <laughs> That's because you don't understand what movie making is. Yeah. <laughs> and after a little while, I'm like, don't you want to go play with the other yeah, kids? <laughs> it also begs the question, turtles have hair? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
was lucky that I had Gary, who was the art director that got me involved with it to start with. And then we had Rory Forge Smith, who was the That's production right. designer. Ah, uh, Rory. Who yeah. Forge Smith. That's all what I was trying to remember. Monty Python movies. Oh, my yeah. God. He was great, amazing. Sweet. He and was. He was. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up with his son, Brendan, who was also, I think uh, he was a lead man or something. Lead on man or reason. decorator, maybe. Yeah, he the decorated two. the second one. Yeah. Right. He's also a hilarious guy. He's now doing like Shit's Creek, and but he's still out there doing it. Wow. Um, but yeah, I was really lucky that I had a mentor like Roy because I'd worked with all these Brits before, like Hugh Scaife mm-hmm, and, right. the, and uh, the other designers um, from Noble House, and they were all Brits back yep. in, back yep, in the they day were. in the art department. So then Roy just seemed like a natural um, evolution for me to work with somebody like that, and he was very, very supportive. If yeah. that, like, even against, like, if I had an issue with Brian Henson over something we were building, Roy would come in and say, no, the way he's doing it is the way it's going to be. Wow. Oh, wow. To, to Brian Henson, much I like. I always thought with the, with the Brits, there's two, two kind of Brits. You know, there's, the, there's ones that just really honor us and, lo- and appreciate us, you know, for just showing up. Right. Um, then there's other ones that no matter how good a job you do or how well advanced you are, you're never actually a proper prop guy. That's right. Mm-hmm. He'll That's never right. be yeah. a proper no. prop guy because no. the caste system. It's A and B. Yeah, it's and, uh, one or the other. With those we had that on King Kong Lives. It was mm-hmm. you know Husque versus Charles Tony Tor- Tony Teeger. Yeah, Charles um, Torbay. Yeah, yeah, you know, Charles. You know, right. You know, and this A is A and B. You know, and Charles and one was of, one of those. You'll Charles, never be you'll good never, enough. Never, never, he'll never be a proper. Problem. He'd also never tell you how to do anything, <laughs> which is fine because he want it done a certain way, but he wouldn't tell you what it was. And he so was, he could bitch just, about it afterwards. Just start doing it. Just yeah, start doing just it. Do it. You know, whatever it was, like, here's a $2,000 saddle. You need to age this. I'm like, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm not I'm going to ruin it. He's like, just start doing it. Just you know, it. drag it around the parking lot, tied to a rope behind your car. That's what we did. That's what we actually did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We did it out at Early Gardens. Like, okay, well, how yeah. many more laps do you want? Because <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do we want this to look like it's been in an accident? Or <laughs> a- a- aging's a pretty simple concept. For yeah, you just tie it to the five ton, drag it to the set, and you're done. <laughs> And then what, sometimes I'll see someone eight years removed from having, they were a PA or they were an assistant or whatever, and I was maybe in some position of authority, and they'll come up to me and I'm like, how did I treat that person? I can't really remember. <laughs> well, I'll yeah. tell you what, I'll tell you what, I was, uh, um, I, I had learned way early on, my, my parents were, especially my father, you know, treat everybody like you want to be treated kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. And, um, and there was a PA on Matlock. And first day in the business, and uh, and I made a big deal about it. Mm. You know, welcome. Oh my gosh, if you need anything. Eight years later, he's a first AD, <laughs> and mm. and and I've I've forgotten him. Yeah. You know, because I had, didn't see him, and he comes up and he goes, "Do you remember me?" I said, "Well, yeah, you look familiar." He says, "You were the only person that day who gave me a couple of minutes, told me that it was going to be all right. Yeah. Just 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 you know, keep your head down." And I've never forgotten you, and wow. and you're one of the reasons that I stayed in the business. Because gosh knows we all wow. know how tough this is. But that just you know meant a lot to me. Yeah, said, but yeah. you you were you were the, one of the only people that treated me decent. I did this little movie here, it was uh, called The List. It was a little million dollar budget, um, kind of Christian themed movie. Gary right. Wheeler, director, wonderful man, right. great filmmaker. And um and they handed us they brought a busload of these kids from a church in Minnesota down here to be our oh interns gosh. right, <laughs> and they gave each department you know an, an intern so from Minnesota somewhere yeah wow. and, they're, and they're sleeping on the floor of the church here in town and and we got oh this guy God. named Jeff Tock, you know in the art department of course we got the weirdest guy this yeah. guy was like <laughs> from Mars had never Always. probably left his little town in Minnesota right the other and. and Corey's with us, Missy Barrett, myself, and Polar Bear, and John Brumell, and we just threw this guy to the wolves. <laughs> and then, uh, it's a movie about lawyers and stuff. On day one, yeah. you know, we had to load up 500 feet of law books into the parish over there at um, St. James. And so we there at 4 in the morning loading up books, and this kid worked hard. You know, we, he learned what it meant to be a set dresser. At the end of that day, um, the director 
is is just kind of a test or joke. He went to every PA he could find, every one of these interns, and says, hey, can you tell me where tomorrow's location is? Just a simple question. Right. And like half of them would go, ah, and run away. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Gary comes to me and says, your guy. You know, I go to your guy, Jeff. I go, hey, man, can you tell me where the location is? He, he, he got a call sheet. And Jeff goes, I ain't got nothing, man, and just walks off. <laughs> He says, he says the best thing. So we're using, I'm going to use this line forever. I, got I ain't got nothing, man. You know, like, <laughs> hey, you know, I ain't got nothing, man. <laughs> All right, so cut, I don't know, 10 years later, and I'm going to get uh, a call from my agent, you know. Um, hey, what are you doing? You go with and I used the line. I said, I ain't got nothing, man. <laughs> he goes, well, Netflix is getting ready to. You know, greenlit this this show. I'll send you a script. It's got a big buzz, you know. And um, and I said, great, yes, yeah, send me. So the agent sends me the beat sheet. Uh, the movie's called Shadow of the Moons. It says a mind bending, twisting tale, written by Jeff Tuck. No way. <laughs> Same kid. Same kid. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it? No, I no. didn't get the job. Oh, you didn't get the job. I ain't got nothing, man. I ain't got nothing, man. <laughs> What's the best script you ever read? Probably hands down, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Really? Now, was that like the first time you read it, you closed it and went, oh my God, or? I sat down and read it in one go. But I mean, like, and, and what was your first reaction when you fit, got to the end? Well, first of all, we had all just learned of Charlie Kaufman in the recent past. And so when I got the script, I was so excited. Why, wow, right. And then, uh, yeah, I just couldn't put it down. I was so excited. This is something new. And, you know, we all do a lot of remakes and this, that, and the other. But it was complete original content. And it was exciting. And it was interesting. And Wow. Yeah. Uh, and what was, uh, what was it like working on that particular show? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, um, it yeah. was tough. It was a really tough shoot. Um However, especially for camera, and I love Ellen Curtis. I think she's amazing, and my dearest friend, Carlos Gala, was the focus puller. Like, I, I loved all of the. I love camera departments. Mm -hmm. I love them. Um, but anyway, and Ellen's really cool, too. I don't know if you know her, but Ellen Curtis, she's done documentaries. She's, a, she's really cool, a, a leader of women nice. in camera departments. Like, she's amazing. Um, but anyway, everything was done old school tricks, like... When Jim would walk into, say, the the doctor's office, right. and he would be in front of camera or whatever, and then he'd, he'd go around. As the camera moved, he would run around the back side, take his coat off, take his hat off, put on a lab coat or whatever, or a different sweater, and come back in the other side oh, so as, the camera pan, as the camera cammed, uh, Cam. camera panned around. That was as the live. I, I, All that cool stuff. I didn't realize we that. set up the, the Chinese restaurant was inside... Uh, the Columbia Bookstore in New York City. Just for the background of the so, so it goes from the bookstore to yeah. the right. to the Chinese. Oh mm. wow! Like it, it, so just in cool camera gags, stuff yeah, like that. in camera yeah. gags, yeah. The bed on the on the Montauk out, you know, by the ocean, which it did happen to snow that day. That was sheer that was, mother that was nature real? and how cool was that oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah no it was pretty cool so camera worked their little yeah. butts off like yeah, no it was woo, wow tough. and it was intense but i loved it wow it that's awesome cool. that's you know, for, awesome. for a prop guy and tell run there's nothing better than an in-camera gag you know that where you do the magic yeah oh absolutely a, a phys mm -hmm. physical it's so trick. cool absolutely love it you know, uh, on on the grip side, it's like doing poor man's process. You know, mm -hmm. when when when, yeah. when you really get all the things, the elements to the point that when you're looking at the monitor and going, yeah, that 
that actually selling. You know, I yeah. mean, there's a, there's a, there's pride. If you in that. do it well, poor yeah. man's process is the bomb. <clears throat> well, it is because you're it's, out of the elements. You don't exactly. have follow vehicles. It's, it's the you don't easiest, have, like it's, it's e- yeah. It makes it so, so easy for the actors to do that. If it works and it's thing. good, yeah, I agree. Like, amazing. Robbie, what's the best script you ever read? Um, I think uh, as I think I said previously, also Lolita, mainly because I was such a a literature fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And sure. This was something I read in and college. And that, yeah. And I loved pretty... Nabokov. And then I read that script, and it was pretty much the embodiment of the novel. That for Nabokov to be Russian-born, and then to write a novel like that in English. Right. And I also, when I was thinking of going to graduate school, I reread Lolita and looked up all the words I didn't know because it was like the best way to study for taking the GRE uh-huh. to read all the you know because he was a master of of language. So. Right. Um, yeah, even Lolita, the way that your tongue moves when you say her name, was an important thing. So. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, the way he described where the various points of where your tongue contact your your upper palate and your lip when you say her name, just simple things like that. You know, wow, it's so amazing. But well, luckily, I had been a prop yeah. master a few times, and I realized like this is a huge show, and I don't care if I'm an assistant. This is a learning opportunity for me. Oh, I, I always felt I've always felt that way. Yeah, I don't have to be key or the best boy, you know. You know, I to, still go do background sometimes yeah. on a big Cause, period because I just, like, I want to work with certain people. Yeah. You know, well, if you're that. in my line of work, there's a couple of prop masters that are like the pinnacle, and Sandy Hamilton is one of them. Wow. He does all the Wes Anderson movies. Oh wow! So it's like incredible, meticulous. I was going to say incredible detail. Yeah. So we had three months of prep on that show and we literally made every single thing. We made every match. But whether you saw it or not, we made everything was real. Everything was researched. Wow. Um, He was just one of those guys that was amazing to work for. Um, I mean, I've been a prop master on a few shows, but I didn't have the knowledge he did. I didn't know how to do the things that he did. How to, you know, how to have a book made. How to make all the little, tiny little things, you know. That takes 40 years of doing it to, to... to explore all those things. I mean, luckily to work with someone like that and then on a big show that, you know, we were scheduled for 70 days of shooting. We shot 120 yeah, days. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and speaking of, like, process trailers, and I remember the very last day of shooting was, like, day 73 of 80 or whatever it was, or day 123 of 80. We were in... Um, <laughs> We were in California. We traveled coast to coast, which is, you know, that's a road movie, yep. really. So we, we were nonstop all over the country, yep. which was also another great thing. And um, Beth, who, my wife, who worked as a prop assistant, too, we were both like, this is never going to happen again. We have chartered jets flying us from one spot to the other, <laughs> you know, and we're shooting in all these incredible locations and multiple units. And um, so we were, I remember the very last day of shooting was like 3 in the morning, I'd kind of become friends with Adrian Lyon because I'm around him for a right. lot of hours right. and a lot of days. Right. But he was still very particular and meticulous. And we did shoot for two weeks, and we scrapped everything, and we started over. We had wow. a very well-known director of photography who he fired two weeks in Jeffrey Kimball. Oh, I remember hearing that story. And then we just started over from scratch. So day one, we were already two weeks behind. You know, we hadn't even started yet, basically. <laughs> but I do remember being in, like, a garage in Northern California at 3 in the morning after an 18-hour day. And him yelling at me, I was shaking the car with the two by fours. Really? You know, and him screaming at me, shake it harder, calling me like all these. I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, but uh, yeah, that was my last memory of of Adrian Lyon. But it was an an incredible experience. No kidding. And when we did, um, like speaking of the script, when we had a question about it, they always went to the novel. So if it was how did this happen or what's the ah. background or whatever. We, they didn't look at the script. They looked at the novel. Yeah. And then we also had Nabokov's grandson who was there who was kind of like an overseer. Who, uh, do you, who, who did the script? Who, who um, wrote the script? A guy named Stephen Schiff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the thing is before that, like David Mamet had written one and I think Harold Pinter had both written one and they just like, nah. Wow. I mean, so wow. some of the biggest writers. Two of the biggest writers. Yeah. 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 Nah. I mean, I'm I think it's moment. just beautiful beautiful yeah. film and it really did embody it i mean when kubrick made it it was a comedy and it's not a comedy it's a tragedy it's sad it's a, it's a right. grown-up man who it is sad know, yeah right um, yeah um so i thought he did a beautiful job with it and it looks an amazing i mean it's a who ended up being the dp a british guy named howard atherton who i don't really know what he'd done before or after but part of it was like adrian 
you know, he'd done all these commercials and he knew all this camera stuff, but he kept telling the first DP, like, I want it darker, I want it darker, I want it darker. So he made it darker and made him come to dailies in here. And he's like, we can't see anything. <laughs> um, so like, well, it's his fault. <laughs> um, so then when we brought Howard Atherton on, he already knew what had kind of happened with the previous guy. Yeah. Right? So he would take six it's easier hours. easier to come in and He'd take take over. six hours to light set. We wouldn't shoot till after lunch all the time. Yeah. I said, speaking of DPs and taking six hours to like sets and scenes, I've also been the exact opposite, which is I, I had an opportunity to work on a show that Sven Nyquist was the DP on, and he had done all the Bergman movies, which are simple and austere and still beautiful. Uh, yeah. And we could literally go into a room and he would put one light, we're lit. That was Gilbert Great? Yeah. He'd put one light outside a window or something, and he'd be like, that's it. Oh, this is I what it would look that. like. You did Gilbert Grape. I mm -hmm. know. I did not know that movie. But yeah, so you could you can you can spend six hours lighting something, and you get a certain result, or you can spend five minutes if you know. Well, what you're see, doing it's what all it's all about knowing what you want, and only experience will give you that education of what yeah. it takes to get it. Yeah, and yeah. nobody questions. And no one, if you do it, will it work? Yeah. Oh gosh. On track twenty nine, that was another script I loved. But um, on track twenty nine. God, I can't think of the DP's name. He did Excalibur. He was amazing. Yeah. But I'll never mm -hmm. forget because talking about, you know, camera moves and handheld stuff, they used Airy because Aries are lighter mm -hmm. than Panavision, and, and they were following a Ferris wheel. And you had two or three different characters on different parts of the Ferris wheel. So as it went around, honey, he'd handheld move it to the different characters, and that focus puller was racking focus back and forth on all of it. Damn, if they didn't get the shot. Like, I mean, it... it you look at all those old things like that, and you're like, wow, yeah. so cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Nicholas Rogue. Okay. Oh, he would sit and tell me stories in the morning. I love the fact that you go that far back. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I we, absolutely we, love that. Here at the studio, yeah. we had a hair and makeup room that was divided by a, por a partial wall. So I was on this side, and Jeff Goodwin was on that side. So Teresa would come in, who was married to Nick Rogue, and they right. had he had – kids from a previous marriage and then he had young kids with Teresa Max and Stat right through the years I've worked with almost all these people <laughs> all of his family <laughs> really yeah oh that is but anyway funny. so she would sit in my chair I'd get her hair done then she'd go around the wall and go to makeup and then I realized at some point Nick was out in the hallway and then I realized he was doing that every day he was so in love with her hmm. and and he would sit out there and just listen to us talk and tell stories you know and one was about insignificance a film that they did because she had them that t-shirt and I was just like oh I love that t-shirt you know and cut to the last day of shooting she was already gone I go into my room and there's her t-shirt she left it for oh. me and, but Nick used to sit out there and listen listen and then <clears throat> he started after she would go into makeup he started coming in and just telling me stories hmm best stories oh, from wow. that man because you know he was an amazing dp and an editor he did so many things before he was a director and i used to love that because he used to tell people about lens and things and we didn't have monitors i don't know if you guys remember if you were you oh, in 29 uh, uh, well, we, no, didn't we didn't have monitors for a lot of films back in yeah. the day you know you, you went over and you looked through the eyepiece yeah. and that's all exactly. you got right? yeah. Yeah. Or, exactly or if you're an on-set dresser you don't get to look through the eyepiece yeah. you yeah. just have to know your lens and your oh fulcrums. no there you go no the grip you gotta know it the grip there department go. only got to look through the lens if there was something specific that needed to yeah. move mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. you know, yeah. and you need to see it from this perspective yeah, yeah. but you're right it was it was yeah. it was kind of hollowed ground you know around the camera back there was great respect Stories. There was, was great respect so about cool. uh, about the camera. There yeah. was great respect mm -hmm. around that Absolutely. camera. Absolutely. You know, nobody nobody put their coffee cups on the damn dolly. <laughs> oh, no. What the? And heck? I was still so green uh, at that point. And like you said, we were all new. We I didn't know how to break down a script. I didn't know how to. Right. I mean, you know, we were all right. so new at these things, oh, and yeah. then you're thrown into being a head of department. That's right. And, I, and I'll never forget it. It's the kind of thing I should have asked like 
a second AD or something, you know. But because Nick was in there telling me stories every morning, I was like, he was my friend, you know. Mm-hmm, right. So I'm on set, and they've got Gary Oldman out in the field and whatever, and... and <laughs> And I'm thinking, do I run in and fix it? Because he had this hat on and the hair. I was like, mm, mm, mm. so finally I'm like, Nick. He says, yes. I said, do I need to run out there and fix this? And he goes, oh, Michelle, it could be an aardvark on a moped for all we know. I was briefed on the song. <laughs> what a great image, though, because yeah, he, he's so true. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, of and all uh, things to say. Yeah, and um, and my goodness, that's a young filmmaker. Um, and look what she's become, Michelle, an esteemed hairstylist, and uh, Robbie Beck, um, a stalwart prop man, and um, and I think really fine examples of Wilmington filmmakers. Oh yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, again, started right here, and both of them, when you look at your resumes, you just go, wow. Yeah. Big stuff. And Big stuff. the passion's still there. It is. These guys are still in the game. I, I feel like if they got calls tomorrow, they'd, they'd be off the, off on the road again. That's right. And um, so, up next. I can't wait. The Reverend Tom Jones. Yes, the nicest man in the film business. You know, he's a construction coordinator, and I'm in the art department, yeah. so he and I work together many times. Yeah. Um, Tom is famous for being calm and collected even on the most strenuous situations and guess what oh you don't i don't have to guess he's now famous yes yes he is but you're gonna have to wait till the next episode to find out about that that's episode five of rap beer the doctor is in can't wait <laughs> <laughs>